morning, I'm Rachel from Tenerife Family Church and I also lead the Living Room Ministry which many of you have probably heard of. It's really great to be with you this morning and doing this reading and I'm going to be reading from Genesis 37 verses 1 to 11. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning and we just thank you for Stuart who's going to come and speak to us now and Father God, we just pray that the spirit of the Sovereign Lord would anoint Stuart right now as he comes to bring your words from the throne room of heaven and how amazing that our Father God, the creator of the whole universe, wants to speak to us this morning. So open our hearts, we pray, to hear your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the live stream this morning. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I was uh, down to speak on Joseph, and I thought, who better to come and share this uh, message, at least this introduction with me, than my very own Joseph. Joseph, do you want to say hello? Hello. Um, this is mainly just for the cuteness factor to... Uh, you know, overwhelm the live stream. Uh, but I thought I'd ask Joseph a couple of questions as well. Joe, can you remember, what does the name Joseph mean? God will increase. That's right. It means God will increase. And that's an important thing into the story as well. And you're wearing a, an amazingly bright T-shirt. I think it's brighter than any other T-shirt I own. Do you remember what's it called when you make a T-shirt like that? A tie-dye. That's right, a tie-dye t-shirt. And so we've been giving family resources on the website, but we've also been emailing around anyone who's got your details uh, just for activities uh, and things you can do alongside the live stream, questions that uh, I'm going to give the answers to as we go along, but also activities you can do. And so if you want to make your own tie-dye t-shirt, and uh, big shout out to Eden Cannon who made this one, um, then the resources for you to be able to do that are there. Um, Joe, you're going to sit down for the rest of it, aren't you? Um, and I'm going to carry on talking. Yeah, there we go. Um, I thought it would be brilliant to have Joseph along um, just as we're talking about that. But before, um, I just want to give a bit of context. Hopefully you were here last week when uh, Ian was sharing about Jacob. The stories that um, follow on from each other in the Bible are really interesting to read together, to learn together, because actually the story of Joseph is massively impacted by the story of Jacob. And the story of Jacob is massively impacted by the story of Isaac. And you see the journey of God's people and how uh, things that happen um, to one family then affects uh, and makes a difference in the other. So Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. And Isaac and Rebekah um, both had a favorite son. And guess what happens with Jacob's family? He has 12 sons and he has a favourite son and that causes a whole load of problems. Uh, from last week, you may remember that uh, Jacob's uncle Laban uh, said, you have to work for me seven years to uh, have Rachel as your wife, the, the woman you love. And so he agreed and it felt like 
uh, a moment as those years went by. But he was then tricked and he married, ended up marrying Leah instead. And Jake, uh, Laban said, you've got to work another seven years to marry the woman you love. Um, as it went on, he ended up marrying both of them. But there was one uh, wife who he loved more than the other. Um, and it was the wife he didn't love so much, who had all of the children. And Rachel remained unable to have children, even though she was the, the wife who was really loved. And so that was a, a point of contention in the family, as you can imagine. And so eventually, when Rachel is able to conceive her first child, um, she's the favoured wife. And so for Jacob, that meant this son was the answer to prayers he'd obviously have been saying. Uh, it was the answer to a promise and a moment. And therefore, this son, Joseph, uh, ended up being his favourite son. And they loved him dearly, which in itself isn't wrong. Again, he wanted to show how much he loved Joseph. And so he bought him this incredible coat, this coat of many colours that was so bright, it's inspired a musical, uh, which you may or may not have seen. It was a gift that showed how much he loved his son. It was a picture of it, but it was a picture of the blessing and the favour and the anointing and the love that he had for his son. And that in itself wasn't wrong. But to do that for one son and, son and not for all of the others was wrong. Actually, Jacob should have honoured all his sons in that way. He should have blessed all of them and called out of them the good things that God had put in each one of them. We also heard from Rachel about the dreams Joseph had. He's already not a favourite brother. He's already got the coat and all of them don't have coats. So there's already a, a fairly obvious sign of his being the favourite. And he has these dreams. He has dreams of 11 stars, sun and moon bowing down to him. Now, if I had 11 brothers and I had that dream, I would probably connect the dots and think, great, all my brothers are going to bow down to me now. And so he shares it probably quite unwisely with them and says, I had this dream. What do you think it means? And into that story, it makes them even more furious. Into that place where they hadn't had that affirmation. They hadn't been given a coat. They hadn't been honoured and blessed for who they were. Suddenly, Joseph comes to them and says, this is the dream I had. This is, what, this is what God said to me. What do you think it means? And so they became more and more furious with him and eventually couldn't take it anymore and decided to capture him, rip his coat and throw him in a pit. Um, and some of them even wanted to kill him. That's how angry they were at seeing him honoured and anointed and not feeling that same love and affirmation from their father. As it happens, uh, Joseph has this knack, as you'll see in the story, of excelling, of making the best of every situation. You think, how do you make the best of being in a pit? Well, if there's two ways out, one is to be killed and one is to be sold as a slave, he makes the best of it and he gets out as a slave, he doesn't die. And you see in the rest of his life, just time after time after time, we see that he manages to excel, to go to the next level. It's almost as if that moment where his father gave him the coat and said, you are blessed, you are anointed, you are favoured, allowed him to live in that and to know, actually, it doesn't matter where I am, I can be the best. I can make the best of this situation. And so I want to show you a picture now, which kind of shows a bit of the ups and the downs of Joseph's life, which I thought actually uh, the Nordens brought out brilliantly um, in their family slot this morning. So we start up at the top. He was the favoured son. There was jealousy from his brothers. He was thrown in the pit, but he escaped death. But he was sold into slavery, which is the first low point. However, he was sold as a slave to Potiphar, who was a very important man. And quickly, Potiphar saw the anointing on Joseph. He saw that whatever Joseph did prospered. He saw that this is a man worth putting in charge of things. And so he became uh, head of Potiphar's household. He was trusted with almost everything other than, uh, I think, the food that Potiphar put into his mouth. But he was falsely accused and he ended up in prison for something he didn't do, which is where the graph dips again. Another low point for Joseph. He did nothing wrong and yet he ended up in prison. However, even in prison, again, that favour, that anointing on him allows him to rise up to be the prison manager. The person in charge of the, the prison noticed something about him and so promoted him even in a prison. It's possible to be promoted. It's possible for the anointing that God's put on your life to make a difference. And uh, he even has two of, um, 
two of the most important officials from Pharaoh, come to the prison with dreams. And he translates them correctly. He thinks, this is it. This is the moment I'm getting out. This is how God's going to end all of this. And he is forgotten. For another two years, he is in prison. Another low point. Eventually, of course, um, we read that the story does change and that he is able to come out and um, Pharaoh recognises the anointing on him as well and he becomes number two in Egypt. Now, just another slide that helps with some of the specifics of of what's spoken about Joseph uh, from Genesis 39, if we have a look at that now. In Potiphar's household, you can read in verse 2 that the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. In verse 3, the Lord was with him and the Lord caused all he did to prosper in his hand. The Lord blessed the Egyptian house on account of Joseph. And you get a sense of his incredible uh, mental strength and resilience to keep going. Uh, In prison, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. And then finally, the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. And so he showed bravery. He showed resilience. He showed an ability not to be defined by the the struggles and the place he was in. Instead, he leaned on his love of his father, that affirmation, that blessing that he knew over his life. And it allowed him to succeed. It allowed him to rise above wherever he was and to make the best of it. Not only that, but he seemed to come out really humble and trusting in God. He, if you read verse 41, um, is a really clear depiction of this. I'm going to read it for you now. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he'd shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Surely this is his moment. Surely all of this has been building up to the point where Pharaoh would say to him, are you the one who can tell me the dreams? I'm almost waiting for him to go, yes, I can. I can do it. This is me. This is my moment. Instead, he says, no, I cannot. I can't do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he wants. What incredible humility. I love that. I love that he doesn't say, yeah, I can do it. He's not, conf- he's not overconfident. He's not arrogant. He's not proud. He's allowed God to work through his character in all of these tough places. And he comes out trusting in God and ready to play the part that God had for him in saving many, many lives. And so the story of Joseph is a memorable one. I encourage you to read it in your own time because it's, it's 12 chapters and I, I can't possibly bring all of it uh, into this morning's message. But it's a really interesting story and there's lots of complexities in it. But obviously in time with this this season that we're doing, this series about bearing fruit in hard times, I think there's two keys that it talks about. One is about knowing we're loved by our Father, knowing we're loved by God. For Joseph, as I've said already, the coat, the blessing, the anointing, the favour that his father spoke over him and gave him a gift, allowed him to operate at that level. He lived into it. He stepped up into it. Whatever situation he was in, he knew who he was and he lived it out. And secondly, he didn't just know it. He rested in it. He spent time in it. He allowed God's spirit to rest on him so that he could excel wherever he was, so that he could be that change. I love that prophetic picture we had earlier that talked about that, almost like that coat of God's presence on each one of us that allows us not to just be, uh, come under everything that's going on right now, but to know that we have God and God's spirit on us, allowing us to succeed, allowing us to thrive and to be everything that he's called us to be in this time. And we see the same in the life of Jesus. As Jesus gets baptised in Matthew 3, we see God speaking a word over his son Jesus. A word that says, I know you. I'm proud of you. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. 
God's spirit resting on him and him hearing his father affirming who he is. This is before he's done any miracles. It's before he's done anything that would make him think, oh, this is just because I've earned it. It's because I deserve it. This is God saying to Jesus, I love you. I'm proud of you. I honor you for who you are, not because of what you're doing or about to do, but because of who you are. And God says the same thing over us. He speaks those words over us that say, I'm proud of you. I know you, I love you, I'm cheering you on. And interestingly, in Jesus' life, it's a second time that same word is spoken. On the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, we see the same thing happening again. He's clothed with God's spirit and hears his father speak over him. This is my beloved son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. This is such a significant time in his life. He's just told his disciples For the first time, I am going to the cross. This is my path. And God, again, speaks a word over him that says, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And if you ever wonder what some of the things about Jesus are that are just so captivating and so incredible, one of them is that he knew he was loved by his father and he was led by that. And he allowed that presence and that favour on his life to mean that he could succeed in any situation, whatever was going on. He knew the anointing that rested on him because his father had spoken to him. And as a church, we believe so much in hearing from God, hearing what God's saying over each one of us, hearing that who we are is important to God. And as we learn to hear that and learn what our original design is, who God's made us to be, and we live into that, then we can do incredible things. The best news of all is that we can come to God as we are. And I don't know if you've heard of the story of the prodigal son, but I want to just look at it for a minute because I think it highlights this idea uh, even more. I wanted to find a picture to show you of the prodigal son, but all of the pictures I found online, I didn't think did it justice. So I'm going to ask you to use your imagination as I read a bit of this story to you. Maybe close your eyes and picture what's what's the image that comes to mind for you. Uh, Another reason I had Joseph here this morning is I love my sons dearly. If there's anything that helps me to understand something of the father's love, it's thinking about how much I love my boys and how much I wouldn't give anything for them. So the story, it goes like this. A father had two sons. The younger son asked him, give me my inheritance now. I want to go and spend it. I want to go and live. I want to make my own choices. And the father reluctantly agrees. He says, okay. And the son goes away and he wastes it in wild living and he gets loads of friends who are interested in his money. And of course, when the money goes, the friends go and he finds himself a long way from home with nothing left. And he ends up taking a job looking after pigs and he's so desperate he wants to eat the food that the pigs are eating. And that's where we're going to pick up the story on our slides. So it's Luke 15 and we'll start at verse 16. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against you and against against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Place a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. One of my favourite things about that is to look at the speech that he prepared in advance. He knew he had to go back to his father and he had a speech prepared. which He thought, if I say this, this will fix it. And often we think, I need to sort this, this and this and then I can come to God. But God says, no, come as you are. And so he only gets halfway through this speech. If you look at it, he never even finishes it because his father runs to him, grabs him and says, bring out things of honour, things of status, things of sonship. 
Bring him a robe to show him how much I love him. Bring him sandals, bring him a ring, which speaks of authority and favor and blessing. He absolutely did not deserve it. He had done the opposite of deserve it. You know the story, his other brother had stayed faithfully working hard. He potentially deserved it. But God's love is for everyone and his grace is for everyone and it's not something you can earn. It's something which he gives freely to anyone who will come to him and say, God, I've got it wrong. I'm coming back to you. And God wants to accept us all as his sons and his daughters. And he wants to put a robe on us and a ring on our finger and sandals on our feet and say, you are my children. And I am placing my authority on you. I'm placing my favor on you. I'm placing my love on you. You may just know how loved you are. And out of that place, make a difference in the world. And the problem is we often try and make a difference in the world without that first step, without being part of God's family, without reminding ourselves every morning, I am God's son this morning. I'm God's daughter this morning. And God invites us all to be part of his family. And we can read this again in Romans 8. Um, Romans 8 says the following, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Isn't that an amazing promise? That God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is available to us this morning. And if you've received the Holy Spirit, that is a sign of your sonship and your daughtership, that you are children of God. What an incredible promise that we might be children of God, which means heirs and co-heirs with Christ. It's incredible if you look at the verses and you take some time to think about it. Because anyone and everyone can come and be part of that family, can come to God and say, I know I've made a mess in my life. I know I haven't got it all right. Would you have me as your son? Would you have me as your daughter? And before they can finish their speech, he's thrown his arms around them. And he said, yes, 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 you're mine. You are mine. And back to the story, Jacob wasn't wrong to honour Joseph. He, he, it was a similar picture. He's putting a coat on him. He's saying, I love you. I'm proud of you. But in the way that he didn't do that for all his sons, he didn't fully represent who God is. He was a picture of what God is not. God does not choose individual people and says, you, I've got a coat for you. I don't have a coat for you. God wants to welcome us all back, every single one. And he wants to say, I have a place for you. You are my children. But it's a bit like the armour of God we were talking at, talking about a few weeks ago. We need to choose to wear it. Actually, if you don't think about it, you don't remind yourself of the promises that God gives us, of the love that God has for you each day, then we end up forgetting. And as we forget, we become uh, more vulnerable to temptation, to looking at others and going, well, why have they got that? Why, why does God love them? Why, why are they doing that and I'm not doing anything? And as we take our eyes off God and his love for us and we start comparing ourselves in the world or with other people we know and come off worse we go what I thought I was loved but if we're strong in that we know God loves us then actually we become less bothered about what other people have in fact it's better than that we start noticing what God's placed on other people and calling it out we start saying I really see God's anointing on you for this I really see that God has given you kindness. And we can start speaking the life that we see on other people. We start celebrating their anointing rather than comparing it with our own and feeling inferior. God has enough love for everyone that we can be solid and firm in that and begin to affirm others rather than be worried about our own place and what we might have. In each one of us, there's a destiny, there's a purpose, there's something that God wants to use us for. He wants us to be part of making a difference in this world, changing this world. But we need to remember who we are. We need to put that coat on 
Maybe it's a, a, a literal thing. I'm not suggesting you go to your front door and put a coat on. It's far too hot for that today. However, a few weeks ago, Jodie was speaking from Ephesians and she talked about taking off the wrong coat and putting on the right coat. And I don't think it's a surprise that the Bible uses this metaphor again and again and again. I'll give you some other examples of where um, it talks about it. In Luke 24, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my father's promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Ephesians 6, put on the full armour of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And Proverbs 31, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. It's the same metaphor. It's talking about how God wants to place these things on us like we were wearing them as clothes that we might remember. Imagine if we all had a coat like Joseph's from the musical. Imagine you were wearing that this morning. I think people would notice. I think people would be like, wow, what's that about? I was speaking to Kerry yesterday. She said, I was walking around with the kids and people were noticing and saying, why? Why have you, you know, what what made you want to make these lovely t-shirts? And they said, well, we've been looking at Joseph and how much God loves us. And it's a picture of his lavish love. What an amazing testimony, an amazing opening for a conversation about how God loves us. So even in the language of Isaiah 61, where we get our name about restoring the places long devastated. If you look at Isaiah 61, there's lots of examples where it talks about clothing or about God giving us um, things. I'm just going to pick out a few verses. Verse 1, 3 and 10. Verse 1 says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Secondly, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And then lastly, in verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me with his robe of his righteousness. Now, if you were really paying attention a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the armour of God, then you'll know that the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness are two of the most important parts of the armour of God because they protect our thoughts and they protect our hearts, our emotions. The peace of God which guards your hearts and minds will keep you in Christ Jesus. That sense of our hearts and minds being so important. And this season of challenge, I mean, Jody led us in some prayers. There's really tough things going on for people right now. And even if you've done all right in lockdown, you've done pretty well. Actually, just mentally, it's been a strain. There's been things that have been really hard. And so reminding ourselves of God's love is really, really important. The band are going to come up in a minute just as I finish. And then we're going to respond in worship. There's songs that I absolutely love. I love to worship because worshipping is often speaking God's truth, reminding yourself of God's truth. I love the song, surely goodness and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. What are we doing there? We're speaking out the truth of God and the coat that we're called to wear. Surely, surely that's true, we're saying. That God's love and justice is peace and kindness will follow us all the days of our lives. Joseph knew his father's love in the pit, in the prison, in Potiphar's, in the palace, in all the places where he was. God was with him and he was able to excel in what he did. If we don't clothe ourselves in the things that God's given us, we won't be able to live it out and bless other people with it in the way that we are called to do. Let's finish with a prayer. Father God, we pray right now. Would you clothe us with your Holy Spirit? Father, there's people watching this morning who've never come to you. They've never offered their lives to you. Then Father, may you encourage them to do so. Placing our lives in front of God is one of the best things we can possibly do. Offering it and saying, God, have this. This is my life. 
And he says, I love you. I'm proud of you. And I have great things for you. Take this robe. Take these sandals. Take this ring. I have authority for you to walk in. I have favour for you to carry. I have blessings, not just for you, but that will rest on you and bless others. And we are blessed to be a blessing. So, Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit now. And as we sing and as we worship, may we be reminded of the truth of who you are in our lives, that we might carry that truth to others. Father, seal this word in us, that we might be reminded every day of how loved we are. In Jesus' name. Amen.